Hi everybody, Patrick from Gold Bio here. Today we have a special video presentation of going over the basics of fibroblast growth factors hosted by our good friend, Dr. David Ornitz. Dr. Ornitz is here from the Department of Developmental Biology at Washington University in St. Louis and with over 168 published papers and 25 years of experience with FGFs, we thought he would be the person to give this presentation. So without further ado. Great, thank you very much and it's great to be here at Gold Bio. Great, let's get started. This talk will provide basic information on fibroblast growth factor and FGF receptor functions. The following questions will be addressed. What are FGFs and FGF receptors? How is the FGF-FGF receptor signal regulated? How do FGFs and their receptors regulate biological functions? So what are fibroblast growth factors? These are a family of protein molecules that are secreted from cells. FGFs function in many organisms, from worms to humans. FGFs bind to and activate a family of high-affinity protein tyrosine kinase receptors. FGF receptor activation elicits a wide variety of cellular responses that are essential for embryonic development, organismal physiology, response to injury, and cancer. FGFs are spherically shaped protein molecules. They interact with protein tyrosine kinase receptors, which have a extracellular ligand binding domain, shown here, and an intracellular tyrosine kinase domain. The receptor binding of an FGF ligand to an FGF receptor requires a cofactor, which consists of heparin sulfate proteoglycans. Over here, we see a three-dimensional view of FGF and heparin sulfate in a complex. We see a crystal structure of FGF complexed with heparin sulfate. The FGFs, FGF receptors, and heparin sulfate form a trimolecular complex with a 2 to 2 to 2 stoichiometry. If we expand this to look at the crystal structure, we can see that the FGF receptors, shown in green, are on the internal part of this um, macromolecular complex, and the FGF ligands and heparin sulfate are on the outside of this complex. FGF binding to uh, the FGF receptor leads to dimerization and activation of the receptor, as is diagrammed on the next slide. So we have an FGF receptor shown here with the extracellular ligand binding domain and the intracellular tyrosine kinase domain. Heparin sulfate proteoglycans are complexed with the receptor, and FGFs bind to and induce dimerization of the receptor. This leads to receptor activation and activation of intracellular signaling pathways. The necessity for heparin sulfate cofactors increase the affinity of the FGF receptor for the FGF ligand. Shown here is an assay in which Cells that express an FGF receptor respond to increasing concentrations of heparin in terms of survival and cell proliferation. What are the mechanisms that regulate the activity of fibroblast growth factor receptors? So several mechanisms are important because this is a very potent signaling pathway. Tissue and temporal specific expression patterns are key to determining when and where the FGF receptor system signals. Secretion from cells regulates the availability of FGF ligands. The affinity for heparin sulfate proteoglycans regulates diffusion through the extracellular matrix. Ligand receptor specificity orchestrates the interaction of the many different members of the FGF family with their receptors. Alternative mRNA splicing of ligands and receptors regulates the activity of and, and specificity of FGF receptors. And the cofactor regulation of receptor binding, including heparin sulfate proteoglycan modifications. And lastly, the regulation of the intracellular signaling pathways is critical to regulating the activity of this pathway. If we look at the FGF receptor complex, we can see that 
After activation of the receptor and dimerization, there's a sequential autophosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase domains. This activates the tyrosine kinase domain and leads to phosphorylation of the adapter protein, FRS2. The phosphorylated FRS2 then binds the adapter protein GRAB2, and this activates the, the RAS RAF MAP kinase pathway and downstream uh, transcription of genes. GRAB2 also interacts with GAB1, which activates the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, and phospholipase C gamma interacts with the phosphorylated FGF receptor, activating its signaling pathway, and the STAT transcription factor also interacts with the FGF receptor, activating STAT signaling. All of these signaling pathways result in the regulation of cell proliferation, cell migration, cell survival, and cell differentiation. Because this is a potent and complex signaling pathway, many mechanisms have evolved to dampen the activity of the pathway. Shown in red are a number of the different molecules that have negative regulation of the signaling pathway, which are important to control its activity in a variety of cells. The FGF receptor is alternatively spliced, and this is important because it regulates the specificity of different FGF ligands. The alternative splice forms are located in the third immunoglobulin-like domain, and the FGF receptor 2B splice form is generally expressed in epithelial tissues, and this allows the receptor to bind to and be activated by FGF ligands that are generally expressed in mesenchymal tissues. The FGF receptor 2C splice form is generally expressed in mesenchymal tissues and allows this splice form of the receptor to be activated by FGF ligands that are expressed in epithelial tissues. An example of expression of different splice forms of the FGF receptor can be seen in the limb bud, where FGF receptors 1C and 2C are expressed in limb mesenchyme, and FGF receptor 2B is expressed in limb epithelium. As the limb develops, this expression pattern is maintained with mesenchymal splice forms of receptors expressed in limb mesenchyme and epithelial splice forms of FGF receptor 2B expressed in the developing apical ectodermal ridge. This apical ectodermal ridge is a critical signaling center for limb development, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, if we look at the family of FGF ligands, we can see that it's a large family that contains 22 members. Today, we're going to focus on the canonical FGFs, which are secreted members of the family that are released from cells, and they bind to and activate uh, FGF receptors. In addition, we have the endocrine branch of the FGF receptors, which are also secreted ligands, but they act over a long distance and signal from uh, one organ to another uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the body. And lastly, there's an intracellular group of FGFs, which are only related to the other members of the family by sequence similarity, and these members of the family actually do not have any FGF receptor activating ability, and they do other things which we're not going to discuss today. If we look at the specificity of different FGFs from different, for different uh, FGF receptors, we see that the FGF7 family, which consists of FGF3, 7, 10, and 22, can very potently and specifically activate the B splice form of FGF receptor 2, and to some extent, the B splice form of FGF receptor 1. In contrast, the FGF8 family, which consists of FGF8, 17, and 18, only activate the C splice forms of FGF receptors 1, 2, and 3. The FGF9 family activates C splice forms of FGF receptors 1, 2, and 3, but also have the unique ability to activate FGF receptor 3B. Now, if we come back to the example of the limb bud, we can see how this potential reciprocal signaling works. FGF10 is expressed in limb mesenchyme, 
but only signals to the overlying ectoderm where it activates FGF receptor 2B and leads to the formation of the apical ectodermal ridge. This then activates expression of FGF8 in the AER, and FGF8 signals back to the mesenchyme to FGF receptors 1C and 2C. FGF10 continues to signal to the AER, and this reciprocal signaling between FGF10 and FGF8 leads to outgrowth and proximal distal patterning of the limb bud. Different cofactors regulate the activity of canonical and endocrine FGFs. So, so far I have told you about canonical FGF signaling in which heparin sulfate proteoglycans act as a cofactor for FGF binding. Heparin sulfate proteoglycans, since they have a high affinity for FGFs, limit the diffusion of FGFs from the tissue and cell type where they're secreted and keep FGF signaling very local to their source. However, the endocrine FGFs have evolved another mechanism in which the cofactor used is a protein called Clotho, and FGFs, endocrine FGFs have a lower affinity for heparin, and this allows them to escape from their site of production and travel a long distance and signal to FGF receptors in other tissues. In both cases, the FGF receptors are activated and autophosphorylated. If we map out the entire family of FGFs uh, and their specificity, we can see that all of the canonical FGFs shown above have affinity for heparin or heparin sulfate and bind to FGF receptors with variable specificity, whereas the endocrine FGFs shown below interact with two different members of the Clotho family, which regulates their interaction with FGF receptors. In summary, what I've told you is that FGFs are a family of secreted protein molecules. FGFs function in the development of many tissues and organs. FGFs signal through a family of high affinity protein tyrosine kinase receptors. And the activity and diffusion of FGFs is regulated through binding to extracellular heparin sulfate molecules. Thanks very much for watching this video. You can find more information in a review article cited below. And I also thank Gold Biotechnology for sponsoring and producing this video. Thanks for watching. Give us a like if you like this video or leave a comment below if you have something to say about it. Uh, we've got a lot of great content on our YouTube channel if you want to check out some other videos, uh, and we'd really appreciate it if you subscribe. Thanks!